Hey guys, it's uh, Ed Woodcox here. I'm here to uh, discuss my new uh, blog that I'm starting, Lucky Hanger 13 and the Totally Modern Mouse. I um, kind of sort of wanted to give you a little bit of background before I got into it too much, but I um, wanted to share with you kind of what got me started in this. And, um, you know, I, uh, I've owned Musketeer 90 Tango for uh, 30 years, and, and to be honest with you, for more than the last 10 years, she's actually been... Uh, 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 kind of in cold storage and um, you know I've been kind of de- grounded for like I say over a decade from medical issues and family tragedy and uh, and um, you know recently you know things have calmed down and, and you know I was wondering should I start trying to kind of work part time toward a partial retirement should I what should I do my life is kind of calming down a little bit uh, work is still crazy busy it became pretty obvious I was never really going to be able to work part-time because there was just so much work I you know I'm lucky to try not to have to work overtime so you know one day I got a letter in the F uh, from the FAA and it said you know the registration on my airplane was up and I just needed to refile it and um and, uh, you know, it just struck me, you know, maybe I should get back into flying. That'd be a good thing to do. Uh, you know, I'm making a lot of money that, uh, I, and I have enough to retire, but I'm making a lot of money and it'd be a good time to um, maybe get back into flying. And so I thought about it and I thought, you know, what do I do? My plane's been in cold storage a long time. I really don't know how bad a situation it is or, you know, you know, kind of what's going on. You know, do I get 90 Tango flying again or do I look like uh do I look for something new and to be honest with you I, I kind of wanted to get a skyhawk I I really like the idea of 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 uh of a skyhawk you know the high wing makes it easier to get in and out of as you get older loading load luggage and stuff into the 90 tango climbing up on the wing and climbing down you know then on top of that if you wanted a, some sort of um um uh new hardware almost all hardware gets approved right off the bat for a Skyhawk, a Cherokee, um, you know, one of those just really, really popular planes. One of the last things it'll get approved for, if ever, is installation on a Beach Musketeer. So, so you know, if you're looking for upgrades, things like that, and and uh, or you need, you know, factory parts, and the factory parts are too expensive, you can almost always find an alternative with a plane like a Skyhawk or a Cherokee. They're just very, very common. Uh, probably the most common airplanes um, in existence. The Skyhawk is the most common. <clears throat> and a lot of the people I talk to, they're like, oh, my God, Skyhawks are so common. Everyone has Skyhawks. Well, you know, that's kind of why I like it. <laughs> Every mechanic knows how to work on one. Every mechanic, um, 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 well, there's just tons of parts availability, whether they're production parts or uh, STC parts. You know, but whatever airplane I was going to get it wanted, I, I wanted to kind of get into the 20th century, get an IFR GPS and an ADS-B transponder. So, you know, whatever I was going to get, I wanted to do a, an upgrade or two on. And um, and um, so, you know, I, want, I was going to see what's going on with 90 Tango. And, you know, one day uh, uh, over a decade ago, I, I just completed my instrument proficiency check. I... I um, I went over and changed the oil in the airplane and put her away in her hangar. In the next few days, I, I departed on a business trip uh, overseas. I ended up spending forever overseas, and for the next three or four years, I just kind of traveled. And uh, you know, after a few months, you know, um, you know, putting her in the hangar, you know, I was still traveling. It was crazy busy, and, um, and my annual had expired. So you know, I, you know, I couldn't see doing an annual on a plane that you know I wasn't going to get a chance to fly, but maybe a few times a week until I um. Uh, until I finished, uh, you know, all this traveling. So I decided to try to get out to the airport, pickle the engine, and, you know, put, put some mothballs in it. And, you know, at the time, I didn't really have the pickling procedure. Oh, my God, if you read the Lycoming pickling procedure, it is crazy complicated. <laughs> so, but at the time, I just, you know, went out and bought a bunch of Marvel Mystery Oil, and I have several cases of Aeroshell. That's the oil I use in the airplane. been a phenomenal oil. I, I, I really uh, I think it's done me well. But, you know, I basically would take the top spark plugs out. I fill the cylinders with um, Marvel Mystery Oil. I turn the prop through, you know, 30, 40, 50 times. And then I uh, put some um, uh, aeroshell in there. Um, and um, and then I turn the prop through 30 or 40 times. So I try to get everything a good coat with the aeroshell. And um, after a few years, you know, work got even worse. I mean, I ended up uh, taking a job as a as a as a lead engineer on a project, and uh, oh my God, it was worse than traveling all over the planet. My wife was excited initially, like, "Oh, I'm so happy you're not traveling anymore," but 
after a couple of months of working on that particular project, she's like, can you get your traveling job back? I used to see more then than, than I do now. Uh, it's, it was just a heck, heck of a time. And, and, and after, a, after a few years, work life just got kind of crazy busy. And, and um, you know, I didn't, you know, go out and visit the airplane and keep pouring oil in the cylinders and spinning it through. You know, I just kind of stopped visiting her. So <clears throat> after, like, uh, uh, after, like, being in storage for so long, it was pretty clear that, um, that um, um, you know, I wasn't exactly certain what, you know, what condition the, the 90 Tango was in. So, you know, basically, you know, and like I say, I did actually put, like, mothballs and stuff like that. So I, I did kind of keep it so that bugs and birds and critters wouldn't get in there and try to live. And, and sure enough, you know, the plane sat there pretty much untouched for years by man or beast. So that was good, too. In fact, you know, she came out real good with, with very little... Um, uh, she actually, after I cleaned her up, she actually looked beautiful. This is here, you know, after I took her out of the hangar and gave her a good bath. The old original panel, you know, a good airplane. This is a great airplane. So, uh, you know, I've had a lot of good luck with it. Um, you know, after I kind of did an analysis, you know, 90 Tango just seemed like the perfect airplane. Like, a, not bad, like, like a Skyhawk even, you know. This particular uh, airplane, this Beach 19A, is, is what's called a 2 plus 2 aircraft. It has four seats, and with full fuel, you can carry two passengers and baggage. And um, uh, if you want to take four people for a ride, you unload a fuel, and um, and you can take actually four people for a ride. So, so not a bad airplane, you know. There's really only I and Rudger, and um, you know, so it didn't make sense to. I could probably get away with just a two seat airplane, but every now and then, it's nice to take uh, you know people on a local flight. So. 90 Tango seemed to be like the perfect airplane for me still. I, I wished I had a high wing. I, you know, I wished I had a, a more common airplane so that it was um, easier to get parts for. But, but generally speaking, 90 Tango was great. It was also great when Marley, Marley and I had no children. You know, we just had our puppet dogs. And, and so, you know, we could travel with a, a little over 100 pounds of baggage. And it worked out real well because Marley, you know, would get like 95 pounds and, and I'd get like 5 pounds. And that seemed to work out pretty well for us. She's not a Spartan traveler. And on the other hand, I just need a bag full of underwear and socks and, and uh, maybe a couple of shirts. So it's good for me. <clears throat> now it's only Rutger and I. This is my wingman, Rutger, my best friend. And uh, he's actually a medical support dog. The last gift my wife gave me before <clears throat> she passed in them. And he's been a great wingman, so, um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, Rucker actually has less baggage than Marilee, and when I wrote that down, I, I did not mean it to sound like a double entendre, I did think it sounded funny, so, so I did want to, <laughs> I did want to repeat it, uh, not that Marilee had a lot of baggage, but to be honest with you, <laughs> she still had more than Rutger, but, you know, uh, both emotionally and uh, when we travel, so, so, uh, this is my man, Rudker, I'll just show you real quick. He he is, he's a great flyer. I actually have a harness for him in the back seat, and I buckle him in. Um, and uh, but today, you know, he wanted to kind of come up front and, and sit on my lap, so I kind of let him come up front, and uh, I took his harness off. Uh, I'll put it back on for for landing. But this is Rudker. He just flies great. Doesn't have a I also have some mutt muffs for him, but this was a short test flight where I was testing, uh, I think, my ADSB receiver or something, and uh, and. Uh, so I, I thought we'd go for a quick ride. Beautiful day. You can see the beautiful sunshine out there. It looks like this is one of the first days that spring had sprung. So my main man, Rudker, great flyer, great partner, and uh, yeah, the perfect wingman. So my decision was like, what I'd probably do is get 90 Tango and Annual, and depending on how well the Annual came out, you know, I would actually just probably keep her and put a new GPS and transponder in here. Uh, so I decided, you know, let's, the first thing to do is actually fire up the motor, see how she goes. I went out, cleaned up the airplane, vacuumed it all out, took all the old stuff out. I still had a pack of old charts in there from, from over 10 years ago. <laughs> so I actually threw those into the recycle bin. And um, basically I um, started doing the Marvel Mystery Oil aerosol treatment. Again, I took the top spark plugs out. I filled it with Marvel Mystery Oil, turned the prop through. And this time I turned it through a lot. And then I put the, uh, the aero shell in there and I turned the, th the prop through once again an awful lot and I did that every single day uh, until I you know I went out and ordered a battery got it in charged it put it in the plane so uh, um, you know I did it every day like eight eight or nine days before the battery came in so every day I just go out there and turn the prop through with oil in it and um, 
put the motor, put the battery in there, dragged it out the hangar, and um, uh, primed the motor, and the, the prop turned three times, and the engine fired. So I thought that was positive, and I put three more props in there. Now, normally, in the summertime, you know, I put five strokes in, and she just fires right up, so in one turn. And, and that's the way she's she's starting up now, so she's really doing well. But here, I, you know, turned it through, uh, and the prop turned three times, engine fired. Yeah, so I was like, that's good. Then I just go ahead and primed it with three more shots and, and turned it through, and the prop just started. Oh, my God. Oil pressure came up. Everything looked great. You know, I sat there running for about 40 minutes while I ran through uh, all the systems, checked everything out, and I and I actually did a bunch of run-ups, you know, um, and everything. Oh, my God. She was just ready to jump in the air. She was ready to fly. It was like I had never left her. And... um Every day until the annual, I decided I would go out and fire her up and taxi her around. And, you know, Rutger and I would just go taxi around Hancock Airfield. At the time, I was based at Hancock Airfield, and uh, which is Syracuse's uh, 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 main airport. And Rutger just seemed, to, as long as we were together, he liked going to the airport. And once we got there, he's a little bored because there's not a lot of people out there. You can see him here in, in this picture here. It looks like he's um, uh, standing there. But you can see his tail is down. Every time after we finished the airport, I would take him to the walk uh, to the park for his afternoon walk, and I think here he's like, "Dad, can we put this away so we can do our walk thing?" But um, um, so you know, basically, you know, she was running great. She looked really great. I put her into an annual, and, and she had uh, you know some issues, some some minor issues, but they were just kind of standard issues, like the like like the spinner had a crack in it. Well, the spinner had a crack in it, you know, before I put it in cold storage, you know, and. Um, uh, you know, basically items like that, you know, but but it really was not a bad annual considering the plane hadn't been touched in so long. And then I lost my mind. So I, I had looked around for a WASP GPS. I decided which ADSB transponder to buy. And this is my old panel, and, and it was a great panel. <clears throat> I got my instrument rating uh, on the panel before this one, which did not have this Garmin in it. It had a, another old Navcom. And that Navcom was, they were about to tighten up the spacing on the, on the, um, on the um, VHF frequencies, so my old Navcom had to go. And that's when I upgraded here with the GPS and this, and this audio panel, fuel computer, that sort of thing. So, you know, this is the old panel, great panel, and then with this old Garmin 295, which at the time was state-of-the-art and extremely expensive, oh my god, the plane was just, I could fly anywhere, it was awesome, and... Um, and even though I had this ADF in here, you know, the only NDB approaches I ever shot was on my training, uh, uh, except for after I got this thing, <laughs> I could shoot a perfect NDB approach. I loved it because I had an HSI on it. I really kind of sort of liked it a lot. I actually got about 150 hours of, of instrument time in, in 90 Tango, and about 40 of those are actual, which, are, which is not a whole lot of instrument approaches. In a musketeer, you're actually just generally flying in the clouds. So um, it's... Uh, and a lot of times you'll bust out of the clouds on approach, you know, really high. So it's not like, um, you know, I got a lot of instrument approaches in her, but uh, but I got a few and, and 40 hours of actual time on this on this particular panel, on this, these panels. So, yeah, my plan was to pull this out and this transponder and just replace those with my new stuff. And, and then I saw the Garmin G5. So the G5s, you know, for you flyers out there, you probably already know, um, uh, can be configured as a... Um, an EFIS, a, um, uh, an instrument. You'll see it here in the next picture, and, and also an HSI. So, so I replaced this with the HSI and this with the EFIS, and um, and I also wanted to get a WASP GPS, and and then finally I decided, you know what, I really want the panel to match. You know, here I've got Garmin and Narco and King, and you know, I just said, you know what, I actually want things to to look like they're meant to be together. I was going to keep this GPS because it's an awesome GPS, and. Um, and I was going to keep this in the plane and just get a WASP GPS or, or another G GPS. And, and I decided, you know what, I really want it to look matched. Uh, so, you know, I basically lost my mind. I went from, a from you know, what would likely be a $10,000 upgrade to be like a $30,000 upgrade. So, so you know, the avionics is just about done. Uh, I actually have a, little, a few bugs here and there to work out, and the shop is so crazy busy that... Really, they don't have a lot of time, so uh, the next time we get in there to tear out the panel, we'll go ahead and fix a couple of those things out. But, um, um, uh, for instance, these two have a serial connection that I want to break, and I want to connect this one to the fuel computer. Right now, all the, uh, the serial ports on this are used up for everything, and I have one connecting these two, but there's no real reason to connect these two because 
this is a WAS and this is a non-WAS, and they can't really trade data amongst themselves. Um, you actually have to have two WASs, and they both have to have the exact same database in them. Um, so I will never likely buy two WAS databases because uh, while it's fairly inexpensive, now I do buy two here, uh, uh, one for here and one for here, so I have the latest IFR data in each of these. Uh, but I'm going to break that serial connection and connect that one to the fuel computer as well. So, And um, basically, um, one of the mistakes I bought was the transponder I got. I got an Apero transponder. Now, the transponder itself is nice, but uh, they advertised it in ADS-B in out. And I recognized that they were using a Stratus receiver for the ADS-B in. And, and it turns out that, um, that, that, that those Stratus receivers are crippled by Stratus. Uh, by Stratus Four Flight and Sporty's Pilot Shop, I've got a review on that coming up. But those are crippled by those, so that they can only use uh, a Four Flight. So, you know, I decided I want to pull that out, and I've already done that, and I've put a Stratus Raspberry Pi in there. I got a video on that coming up too, uh, so I can show you if you have an Apero transponder, you can wire in a different um, ADS-B in receiver, and um, and it works just like an ADS-B in-out transponder at that pot price, at that at, uh, at that point. But it basically, you know, everything was just just everything is just about perfect. It's a beautiful, beautiful panel. I absolutely love it. The other thing I upgraded was, uh, you know, here I had an old turn coordinator, and that turn coordinator looked positively 1960. So I I wanted to get a I'm sorry a, an old turn and bank indicator, and I wanted to replace it with this turn with a turn coordinator. So I actually bought this turn coordinator for like 175 dollars, uh, pulled out of another airplane for an upgrade, and uh, this uh, vertical speed indicator, the vertical speed indicator that was in my plane at the time, did not pass the um, pedostatic check. You know, you, you don't you, it won't fail your pedostatic check. You're still IFR approved, but it was not operating properly so I decided to um, to replace that as well and I actually got this one for $125 so a lot of good deals to be had out there you know if you go buy these new they're like 350 400 bucks so um, buying them used and serviceable it was a good way to go and, but otherwise the plane is just about perfect you know I actually you know <laughs> three GPS's this is another GPS here's another GPS with all these GPS's there's a pretty good chance I'm not gonna get lost so so, you know, the, the avionics upgrade is done. You can see here I've got the, the Garmin EFIS. I have the Garmin HSI. I have two Garmin uh, GPS navigators. The top one is a ADS-B, I'm sorry, a WAS uh, GPS. This GPS here is a 490, a 495 or 496. Um, and, um, and basically I got this because I want to use it basically as a satellite XM receiver. I didn't really get it to, to be a navigator, although it's a pretty awesome navigator, too. It really is nice to have it in the panel. Here is another EFIS that I had bought. Originally, when I pulled out the uh, uh, ADF receiver, I planned on rem removing the ADF head, which was in this hole here, and just putting this here, and then I would have like an EFIS with my old boiler gauges uh, here. But I just decided, no, I want to get these um, these garments. And if I want to get these, I want to get these to match. And uh, and so I thought I'd go ahead and put this on the co-pilot side so that, you know, somebody flying over here can actually have a, a, a their own ethos. So, <coughs> so I'm real pleased with the avionics, and, um, and, and I absolutely love them. You know, still have my fuel computer there, still have my gem engine analyzer, which, by the way, a couple of flights ago it died, so I've ordered a replacement for that. Um, but I was able to report, order one that was been serviceable. So the new, um, the new um, uh, jam analyzers are, are even nicer. But oh my God, they're pretty pricey. So, so, so there's my panel. I'm really pleased with it. Basically, um, basically, um, the, you know, the current status. You know, my motor's running great. Has 400. Has less than 450 hours since factory overhaul. So, you know, she's a top-notch running motor. Avionics upgrade is, is when I say it's perfect. I mean, I absolutely love it. But there are a couple of things to fix on it. And um, using my uh, this one here with this hockey puck to be a satellite receiver, not so much a navigator. But in worst case, if I if I lose all my power, both of these are battery backed up, so I can I can you know if I lose all my power, I can still fly and, and, and navigate and, and this would be my navigator um, uh, these can help me maintain uh, orientation this particular instrument has every one of these 
built into this one instrument. So this instrument here is a six pack on its own, and uh, including it, it, it displays this information as well across the top, and and you can swap these two around, or you can make them both the same. If one of them fails, you can you can make the other one that. It's a really neat feature. I do like the Garmin G5s. They're a phenomenal, phenomenal um, set of instruments. So. So um, uh, let's see here. So uh, I bought the second 430. I wanted the panel to match. Do they match? They look beautiful. Uh, and I got this uh, instrument to drive it. So it's fully IFR certified as well uh, with a Garmin GI106. So this drives the HSI. This drives this indicator here. Still got the fuel computer there. It's just too important for me to lose. I love that fuel computer. Uh, hard to run out of gas, or are you going to know exactly when you're going to run out of gas using that fuel computer? It's very accurate. And um, uh, engine monitor, audio panel, intercom, and digital um, uh, OIT voltage. One of the things I wanted, you know, there's up here uh, right above this uh, Garmin mount, there's a uh, outside air temperature gauge. It's an old mechanical gauge, and and on a, <laughs> a bumpy flight, I can barely read it. The, the little teeny numbers, I just can't read it anymore. So, so I installed a digital outside air temperature. Uh, it displays it in centigrade, Fahrenheit, and it also gives you the, the system voltage. So that's a pretty neat feature. Then, of course, uh, as I'd mentioned, I have the, the EFIS on the co-pilot side that I put in there and uh, and run. And I installed four USB charging ports in the front area. You can see there's a two right there on that, uh, uh, on, on that particular uh, port. And then down below on the console here, I have another one here installed right next to the cigarette lighter. So, really a nice upgrade, really impressive. You know, um, this is bringing the airplane into the 21st century. Uh, it's June right now. I'm sorry, it's May right now. Next month is June. June the 19th, my airplane is 50 years old. She's going to be 50 years old. So, uh, I thought it was June 10th, but I just looked it up in the, man in, the, in the log books, and it was actually June the 19th when 90 Tango was officially commissioned as an airplane. So, unfortunately... I planned on pl flying on on the on that day, and uh, unfortunately, once again, I'm going to be out of town on business. So, um, uh, I'm heading to Australia. So, uh, I'm going to be way out of town. I'm going to be halfway across the planet. I'm pretty disappointed. You know, everyone's like, "I want to go to Australia," and I'm like, "Dude, I can hook you up. I can show you." And once you tell them, <laughs> they can go on your trip for you. <laughs> Nobody seems to really want to go. So that's all just kind of talk. But. Uh, Anyways, that's not here to there. I'm going to have to take that trip. I'm hoping it's my last trip ever, uh, international trip ever, uh, uh, unless I can fly somewhere from 90 Tango, which would take forever. Anyways, here's where I stand right now at this point, 2018. You know, the avionics upgrade is about 95% complete. I've ordered a PowerFlow exhaust, and that is coming in at the end of June. Uh, I have Vortex generators for the for the flight controls. Uh, for the for the flying surfaces here, the vortex generator are little tabs that you hook on there, and they and they um, and they generate a turbulent flow over the wing that makes the that, that flow stick to the wing, and it lowers the stall speed by about ten knots. So a lot of these are basically safety upgrades that I've had a desire for for a long time. Uh, and when I originally bought the plane, uh, within a few years, I wanted to look at vortex generators, and they were not approved for use on the on the Musketeer series. So you know, there wasn't any point in getting them. Now they are approved for the Musketeer, and um, and um, and I'm excited to get those installed. I actually have those, and I have paint matched to uh, to paint those. So I'm going to install another USB charging port in the back. I actually have the USB port, and it is sitting in the airplane. Uh, now, when I bought the plane, you know, this plane does not have shoulder harnesses in it. They didn't actually become a production item in this airplane, or at least a production option, until about four years later. In 1972, they became a production option, and they did not change their type certificate on the airplane to put those in. Uh, so, basically, if you just mimic what Beach did on those shoulder harnesses, you can install them with just the mechanic sign-off. So, uh, originally, I was going to buy some uh, buy the shoulder harnesses, and my mechanic came back and said the hardware from um, from Beechcraft was uh, about eleven thousand dollars, which just about gave me a heart attack. I'm like, what? Eleven thousand dollars for for uh, for something like that? You think they'd give them to you at cost because they want safety features in airplanes? But but no. And by the way, the cost of those have gone up to five thousand, fifteen thousand dollars now. So if you buy the official Beech parts, 
they're 15,000. But I'm in a type club called the Beach Aero Club, and there's a mechanic there who uh, was able to install uh, uh, shoulder harnesses in his musketeer, and he made the brackets just like the drawings from Beach and um, and um, and his mechanic. So his FAA guy down there, right before he retired, wrote it all up so that installing uh, these production uh, intent uh, style parts um, uh, would be just a mechanic write-off so we can reference that uh, that approval and just do this once again with a mechanic sign off so he has the he makes the brackets that you need to attach to the airplane and uh, and and he sells them for 50 bucks a pair an incredible deal when you consider those same damn brackets are like fifteen thousand dollars actually I believe the brackets are extra the fifteen thousand dollars will get you inertial reels and um, uh, and and webbing. So I believe it's extra to get the brackets. The brackets here were fifteen thousand dollars, and then I ordered uh, uh, from a salvage yard the inertial reels that match the part number that are in the beach airplanes. So basically, those inertial reels were about two hundred bucks a piece, and then I'm getting them rewebbed for a hundred and a hundred and twenty dollars a piece. You know, basically, I've got seven hundred dollars into the shoulder harness upgrade. And um, uh, uh, quite a difference from fifteen thousand dollars. So, uh, so I'm finally going to get my dream shoulder harnesses. Uh, it sounds silly. I hope I never have to use them, but it will be good if I had them because uh, they increase survivability intensely if uh, anything bad ever happens. Uh, I ordered rosin sun visors. Those are in. Um, so um, I'll be replacing the old floppy sun dry visors in there that I have to rubber band up. Uh, 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 with the ro with the brand new rosin sun visors, and oh my God, they look beautiful! I can't wait to get them installed. I've been looking at a 406 megahertz emergency locator transmitter. I, I've been thinking about buying one and installing it. I may buy a small personal one that I can keep in the plane, and and then you can just activate it in a satellite, um, uh, uh, and it works with satellite rescue services. So the personal one, so. Likely, I may end up going that route because those are only like three or four hundred dollars, and there's no installation in those. So, uh, at any rate, I'm going to have an emergency beacon in the plane. The one that's in there now is the old 121 megahertz one. It's still useful. Uh, they don't have a lot of good luck, I think, finding people with those. I mean, uh, so the new ones are much improved. I do intend to get um, do intend to get a safety beacon or a, 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 an emergency beacon in my plane. A lot of little maintenance items. I have a, 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 a the door latch on this thing does not hold the door open. So it's the little it's the little scissor arms down there that you're supposed to open. It's supposed to hold the door open while you, but you know it basically the door flops around. I, I tighten it down the screw. It works. For, it holds it for a, you know a couple of door openings, but then the screw loosens loosens up. I'm gonna I, I got a pneumatic one that while not approved for the musketeer, it's just you know remove two screws and put these one back with two screws. My mechanic thinks he can get it installed with just a sign off, so so um, I'm going to repair that door latch finally. So the rosin sun visors and the, and the door latches have just been an annoyance ever since I owned the airplane. Time to get those repaired. The tail bearings or the tail, the bushings and the bearings are a little bit sloppy. The, the tail moves probably not even a sixteenth of an inch, but if you jiggle the back of it, it kind of it kind of moves a little bit. I um, I also wanted to do a dynamic problem. I had a little bit of vibration in the plane. Uh, the mechanic said it was in spec, but he was able to reduce the vibration a little bit. And I'm going to be honest with you, um, it seems to be uh, an improvement. So uh, so that's a good so that's a positive thing. I really noticed the vibrations when I started filming. I've got a lot of videos in the airplane for this blog, and uh, and oh my God, some of them are so shaky they're hard to they're hard to watch. So. So um, I guess it's going to be a lot of B-roll that I might use sometime in the future. But, it, you know, when I saw how shaky it was, I'm like, i got to do something about it. And the dynamic prop balance is done now. Uh, uh, Luke, my mechanic, said it was in spec. But, in fact, it's even slightly better than that. And then I'm replacing my gym engine analyzer. Um, I've actually already got a new one on order. Uh, I'm sorry. I got one that's been pulled out of an airplane and serviced by an avionics shop. So I'm getting an 8120 with it. And um, or a yellow tag or a, you know whatever whatever they call that stuff it's a, the, the paperwork that says it's serviceable so so um I'll be replacing that gym analyzer basically when I'm done with this I will have all the safety features the power flow 
the uh, the shoulder harnesses, uh, the, the the emergency beacon. I'll have all the latest safety features, and um, and I'll just have a lot of neat features. These vortex uh, uh, generators are gonna. Uh, I consider those a safety upgrade as well because they help the low low speed performance, and the power flow exhaust. They say gives you about a 22 horsepower increase in performance. So um, uh, the motor. You know, there is a 160 horsepower upgrade that you can put on this airplane, uh, and, and you don't want to do that unless you're putting on a new motor. I, I, I actually considered it when I when I got this factory motor so many years ago, but um, but it was actually substantially more money to do that than just get the, the get the stock motor in it. And it sounds kind of crazy, but it it because the the motors are almost identical. But um, but you know, I got the 150 horse with the power flow exhaust. Uh, 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 the, the the vortex generators and these wing tips that are already on it. I couldn't get the vortex generators in the old days, so I got these wing tips, and they did help our low frequency, our low speed performance. But the vortex generators are really the way to go. So and now that they're approved for the Musketeer, you can bet your bottom dollar I plan on getting those going. So uh, and, and then of course replacing the Gemini. So my baby's going to be is 50 years old, and you know basically she's going to have all the modern. Uh, 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 amenities of a plane that comes off the factory line so my totally modern mouse and um pretty excited about getting the other upgrades in there i'm thrilled to death about the the uh, avionics upgrades and i am hoping to um, uh, go back and start my instrument recurrency training i'm probably going to do i'm probably going to do another instrument proficiency flight and i am expecting it to take you know 10 hours of flying or at least because i got to get back up to see i've been shooting approaches with the with the stuff visually <laughs> and oh my god even visually <laughs> i am so all over the place so i desperately need to get some training and get back um get my get my instrument skills back up to day, date so i'm pretty excited about the whole thing the, the avionics are beautifully um my annual is in august and that's likely when i will do some of these other upgrades i'm hoping to do the vortex generators before that there'll be a video on that planning on putting the little stall strips on the wings and going out and running through a full stall series and videoing that and then we'll put the vortex generators on there and run through the same stall series again and just see how she looks so man i tell you what i'm so excited about this and you know even now 90 tangle flies like a dream the motor purrs like a kitten and with these other upgrades i'm just going to be in probably hog heaven <laughs> so let's see so what's this vlog about you know well i kind of want to tell you a little bit about the upgrades as they come along kind of walk you through maybe give you reviews of some of the stuff like that dynon d2 a phenomenal phenomenal portable ephus that just works beautifully Troubles that I've had, you know, I've already had some troubles. I'm not terribly impressed with the Apero Transponder uh, 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 Stratus uh, combination. A horrible, horrible mistake. Uh, it was like the lowest cost ADSB in out solution you could find. And, you know, my wife used to accuse me of being cheap, so cheap that we ended up spending extra money. I have already contemplated pulling out with less than six months on that on that it was done in july i did my transponder fly off i'm sorry in january i did my transponder fly off in january and i'm actually thinking about pulling this one out and putting the l3 in there um uh, this one is so disappointing now i've actually got it kind of working we'll talk about that in a future video uh, we want to talk a little bit about the repairs and maintenance that we do on the plane and you know cost of ownership things that some of you guys might be interested in if you're thinking about your own airplane Product reviews, I have um, a lot of GoPro and Sony cameras. I've got some 3D cameras. I've already got a lot of 3D uh, uh, video from the plane of flight, and it's really cool. It's a neat, neat way to uh, uh, to film. Uh, and I'm planning on, now that the weather's warmed up, putting some external mounts, just the adhesive mounts on the plane. And with those adhesive mounts, you know, I'll be, um, you know, I'm thinking about putting one right up here. Uh, I have uh, three GPS antennas on the top here and a triangle, and I'm thinking about putting one of my um, 3D mounts here so that I can mount a, a 3D camera on the top. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, 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 these product reviews of the ADS-B in portable receivers. I have I have several of them, including a Stratus that came with my transponder. Very disappointing, very disappointing because it's basically locked to anything but for flight which is a electronic flight bag that i don't use so we're going to talk about that coming up uh hangar stuff what's going on with hangar 13 um 
she really has just been a phenomenally lucky hanger. And uh, I actually got a video about that, you know, if you want to hear why I, what has been so lucky about Hanger 13. And and then, of course, I'm going to talk about anything else that comes to mind. So, so guys, that's where we're going with this. I hope, um, I, hope uh, I know this is probably a little bit of a boring video, but I'm hoping that you'll tune in and kind of see where we're at. Check in with us every now and then. You know, subscribe if um, uh, you think this is a worthwhile blog. This was an interesting uh, show. Give me a thumbs up, you know. If you don't like it, give me a thumbs down. Uh, tell me what you think, and you know I'm always interested in in, in your responses. So uh, feel free to comment down below, and I'll respond to you. So guys, thanks for dropping in. I hope you enjoyed the blog, and you will come back and join us again. Have a great one. Talk soon. <laughs>